So good morning everyone, welcome to Turbulence. Uh, we shall continue the lectures. Last time we started the lecture on wall flows. We discussed uh, the fact that wall flows are very important types of flows. Almost anything you design in the engineering world has walls uh, as it interacts with the fluids. And as a result, you have to understand flows near walls really well. So that chapter started to look at that uh, issue and then we are going to finish the chapter on wall flows today, uh, do an exercise and start another exciting chapter which would be uh, jets or so to speak free shear flows. So where we, where we left off last time was the concept of wall units Y plus. Anytime you want to uh, uh, implement an engineering method to solve some problem, you normalize the problem. Uh, we use the example of the Moody chart, which is the, a normalized pipe flow, where you look at this chart and regardless of what uh, size dimension pipes you may have, uh, you can normalize the pipe and then read the Moody chart. Uh, look up a friction factor and so on for a given roughness uh, scale. Um, here the same idea, you would normalize wall units basically uh, by dividing uh, any distance away from the wall by the um, viscous length, delta sub V. It tells you how many viscous lengths you're away from the surface. Basically, how far into the turbulent region you are. And that's known as Y plus. So we'll continue and underline a few concepts here. If if y plus is a small, then the relative importance of viscous processes is higher than turbulent processes because you're in the viscous layer. Viscosity dominates in that layer. While if y plus is large, the relative importance of turbulent processes is higher. Okay, so that's how important this parameter is. In fact, knowledge of the magnitude of y plus is sufficient to understand which wall regime is, is present with respect to viscous and turbulent processes. And people have done a really nice work in categorizing and subcategorizing regions of flow near a wall, which I would like to show you here. So this figure 5.2 shows the classification of wall layers and regions, basically sub-layers. You have two main layers, we know them as inner layer and outer layer, and then each layer has its own sub-layers. Okay, so the inner layer starts from the wall. Basically, if you want to read this plot, the, the wall is is the, the vertical axis, that's the surface of the wall, and the horizontal axis is y plus, it shows you how far away you are from the wall. So this is the wall, the inner layer starts at the wall with a y plus of zero and then ends in somewhere in the whereabouts of y plus around 1000. The outer layer it starts at a y plus of about 50 and then goes all the way up to 10,000 or so. Of course, the inner and outer layers overlap. Now, let's look at each individual sublayer. In the inner layer, you start with the viscous sublayer. This is the sublayer that viscosity dominates, and it dominates from the wall all the way to a y plus of 5. Then you have the buffer layer, which starts from uh, y plus 5 to about 30. This is the region that you get a mix of uh, viscosity and turbulence. You get a mix of both. Flow is very transitional in this re region. It's very difficult to understand and model. Typically, you must avoid this region at all costs, if you can. And then the combination of the viscous and buffer sublayers is known as the viscous wall region. Well, they call it the viscous wall region because everywhere here viscosity is present and it manifests itself in the flow. After the viscous wall region, the log wall region begins, where you have um, the 
range from about y plus 30 to about two or three thousand. And it, they call it the log law region because in this region you can very well fit well-defined um, mathematical functions to, to the flow. There is the power law uh, fit, there's the logarithmic law, there is the, you, can, you can fit many laws into this region. And most typical and classic uh, fit is, is a logarithmic fit. So people call this log law, but you can by the same token call this a power law region, whatever. And of course, the two uh, layers overlap, I mean the, the outer and inner layers overlap, and this we know as the overlap region. So it's a very, very useful diagram. And if you might ask, okay, if I can normalize distance away from the wall, can I normalize velocity? And the answer is yes, and in fact you should. You, you must develop a non-dimensional mean velocity, which is the mean velocity divided by the friction velocity. If you take the mean velocity of the flow, angle bracket u, divided by the friction velocity, you get a new quantity, u plus. It's defined as such. So this is the non-dimensional velocity. In um, turbulent flow analysis, a critical task of an engineer or scientist is to find a functional relationship between y plus and u plus. If you want to develop a normalized approach or method for understanding wall flows, you must know the relationship between normalized distance away from the wall and normalized velocity. And this relationship we know as the law of the wall. As, as we said, there are many laws of the wall. There's not just a unique law of the wall. So the functional relationship functional relationship is called law of the wall. times for a typical flow, as we said, the law of the wall yields three distinct regions. The, there's the viscous sublayer, the buffer sublayer, and the log log sublayer. And I would like to show you uh, a diagram before we delve into the mathematics. So now we are talking about um, this heading. Viscous, buffer, and log law sublayers. Let me show you the plot before we do the math. So here in this plot again, the wall it would be here on the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is the distance away from the wall. So it's the normal direction away from the wall. So the horizontal axis. The vertical axis, it could be the wall, but it's useful to plot non-dimensional velocity, or u plus, on the vertical axis. Okay? Now, let's study the functional relationship. First, first of all, be careful that I'm using different scales for y plus and u plus. For y plus, I'm using the logarithmic scale. See these um, units jump in a certain way? Basically, one, ten, hundred, a thousand, that's the logarithmic scale. However, on the vertical axis, on, for u plus, I'm using a linear scale. So I'm sort of mixing the, the two types of scales in this plot. In the viscous sublayer, which is uh, the beginning here from the wall to a y plus of five, there is a very well known functional relationship, and that 
is given as such. Actually, u plus and y plus are equal to one another. That is your functional relationship, which would certainly give you a line if you were looking at linear linear scales. But because you're looking at linear logarithmic scales, the line here looks uh, as a curve like that. But it's actually, in fact, a line in the linear scale. The Buffer sublayer is where the effects of both um, viscous and turbulent um, physics manifest themselves. And you get a mix of both. It's not very easy to find or know this functional relationship. It's a mix of linear and logarithmic, or the other power laws. So we tend to avoid this a lot of the times. But in the log law sublayer, where you start from 30 all the way to a few thousands, on this axis, the um, relationship is linear, which means that y, u plus is related to the logarithm of y plus. That's why you call this the log law. And the, the, you, you can very, very, very nicely fit a um, logarithmic um, equation to u plus as a function of y plus. Okay, so now let's look at the mathematics of this. One of the first uh, persons who studied laws of the wall was Theodor von Karp. In fact, he was a, a student of Ludwig Prantl, uh, who worked on this. And he formulated this very nicely. In viscous sublayer, where y plus is less than 5, the functional relationship between y plus and u plus is linear, as we said here. So u plus is equal to y plus. He found that in the buffer sublayer, where y plus is from 5 to 30, there is no relation, simple relationship between u plus and y plus, where in this region, both viscous and turbulent processes manifest themselves. And in the log law region where, or sublayer where, where y plus is greater than 30, the relationship between u plus and uh, y plus is logarithmic. And he fit this relationship. He called um, kappa after his own name, on Karman constant 0.41, and then constant B or the intercept as 5.2. And by and large, these two constants show up. I mean, anytime you fit the, the log log um, for a wall flow, by and large, you get the same constants. It's sort of like a universal law. It happens a lot of the times for ordinary flows. So kappa is the von Karman constant. and B is another constant. Okay, this is the normalization, essentially. Right, this, this is the, so that means give me any flow of reasonable characteristics, give me any wall flow, I can demonstrate that this relationship will hold between U plus and Y plus. If I normalize velocity with friction velocity, if I normalize height with viscous slings, this relationship will hold for most of all of us, extremely useful. Okay, so any um, questions before we do a problem from this chapter? Any questions from the online viewers? They can put comments for sure and we'll get back to them. Let's do the exercises. I have a very nice exercise for you that I will do. And I, I want to do exercise number two. Very nice. It's brand new. I made it myself. So I hope you enjoy that. It's very long, but let's read it uh, patiently. The law of the wall states that for the viscous sublayer, u plus is equal to y plus. 
where for the log, log u plus is 1 over kappa ln of y plus plus b, where kappa and b are where the constants. It is desired to calculate the point of intersection of the two equations as if they were going to meet. I mean, if you pretend that the um, viscous law will, will be valid all the way up to up to here, you get u plus equal to y plus value, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the log law became valid. I mean, I'm asking you to pretend as if the curve looked like this. You see what I'm doing? It's an obviously an approximation. I want you to calculate what's the point of intersection of the two laws. So that's the idea here. Of course, um, this is not a very simple calculation. You can't do this exactly. Uh, and an exact calculation will be very difficult to do because you have to log, solve a nonlinear system of equations for both y plus and ln of y plus. If you were to solve an equation which involved both types of unknowns, it would be a nasty set of equations. You don't want to do it. But, but you can approximate. Um, um, the first approximation for a pseudo y plus in, by obtaining it by replacing the log law with the first or, order Taylor expansion of the log law, and we'll do it. And you can you can do this expansion near a point of interest y plus ten, and then solve for a more accurate y plus. I mean, you can look at here and say, okay, by and large, the point of intersection occurs near y plus of 10. I mean, it's by and large close to 10. It's not close to 1 or close to 100. You're going to tailor expand the log, log around 10, and then solve uh, the very simple linear system of equation. And if you did that, you could show that the, the two curves meet at about a y plus of 11.5. Let's do this. Have you heard? Uh, have you used the Taylor expansion before? Most engineers have, especially if they do approximation or numerical methods. <clears throat> the entire premise of computational dynamics is falls under the idea of Taylor expansion. Basically, that's how important it is. And how we do it. I want to play a mind trick with you as I do this. Exercise. I showed you the curve for For u plus on that axis and ln of y plus on this axis. Okay. Now I want to play this trick. I want to now swap the two axes, put u plus here, now put y plus here, and I want to show both of them on linear scale. The question would be how would the, law, uh, the, the laws of the wall appear here? It's a mind trick. Can you tell me what the care for the viscous region should appear on this plot? Straight line, right? That's, of course, expected. This is where I have u plus. y plus is equal to u plus. u plus is equal to y plus. u plus is equal to y plus. The more difficult question is, how should the next curve appear for the log log in this plot? Anyone? The, uh, the exponential. 
look like look like an exponential. Yeah. So it's going to look like sort of like this. Which would be u plus. It's still u plus 1 over kappa ln of y plus plus b. Still the same equation, but it just appears as exponential. Why does it appear as exponential? Well, we'll think about this. In calculus, in calculus, if you want to plot y equal to ln of x, In calculus, y equal ln of x appears like that. If, if you flip the x and y, if you flip the x and y, well, the, the, the same ln curve appears as an exponential. But it's still a ln. I mean, this is still y is equal to ln of x. And here we are playing that mind trick and want you to Accept uh, the, these shapes for the curves. And again, this problem is asking where the point of intersection will be. So I'm looking at this point. Let's begin with Taylor series expansion of any function. Taylor series expansion. of any function, say phi, not to be confused with passive scalar, near some given initial point xi, will be given as follows, and this is in the appendix of the book. If you expand phi of x near xi, this is approximately equal to phi evaluated at xi plus x minus xi. Now, x is the variable in this function. xi is a fixed point. Derivative of phi with respect to x evaluated at xi plus higher order terms. And it's up to you how many terms you want to continue. Of course, if you continue the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and so on, derivatives of phi with respect to x appear here. Our goal here is to express, think of phi as u plus. Now, u plus is a function of y plus. We should Taylor expand u plus, as if Taylor expand is a variable. Right. In my world, it is <laughs> like Google is, right? Uh, y plus. Say y plus i, 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 I evaluated it, first of all, at y plus i. Plus b, now I have. y plus minus y plus i. What's the derivative of u plus with respect to y plus? Anyone? It's a derivative. Because I need the derivative, the first derivative. Yes, the online viewer was right. We heard you. 1 over kappa y plus. Derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. Of course, kappa here was just coefficient behind ln. And I have to evaluate this expression at y plus i. So it looks very nice. It's not that complicated. So u plus at expanded around 10. Remember, what we wanted to expand it around 10. Or if you like, y plus i is equal to 10 here. 
is equal to the one of the von Karman constant, 0.41, ln of 10, the constant was 5.2, 5.2, plus y plus is my variable in this function, minus 10, 1 over 0.41 times n. Now it's a linear function of y plus. It's not a logarithmic function of y plus anymore. Now you, you, you just need to match this. So now match this with u plus is equal to y plus. y plus should then be equal to ln 10 over 0.41 plus 5.2 plus y plus minus 10 times 0.41 times 10 and simplifies to 10.8 plus Four, five plus minus two point four four. If you rearrange this, then y plus is approximately equal to eleven point one. That's the point of intersection. What's the unit of y plus? Is it meters? Dimension less, because we already divided it by the viscous length. And by the same reasoning, unit of u plus is also dimension less, because it was already divided by another velocity, which was friction velocity. So both y plus and u plus are unit less. Hopefully you enjoyed this problem. Now we will begin the next chapter, which is free shear flows. Of course, there are many, many, many flows. I mean, there's compressible flows, there's supersonic flows, there is shock flows, shear layers, you know, there's, there's just many, many flows. Uh, but for the purpose of this fundamental course, we just show you two instances of those flows. Uh, which was, was wall flows and jets. However, each of these chapters could be a textbook in itself, right, which uh, exists out there and you can go and continue to read and explore for your research, whatever reason. So now let's look at uh, jet flows, or which is an instant, instance of free shear flows. Chapter 6. Typical examples of uh, shear flows uh, refer to jets, wakes, and mixing layers. Why, why do we call uh, these free shear flows? I mean, what's the main difference between free shear, shear flows and wall flows? Anybody wants to try and guess? Free. The key. The, the the key word is free. For wall flows, you need a surface. You're limited, bounded by a surface, or many of them. So there's a surface nearby. There's an object, solid object near the flow. For free shear flows, there is no solid object near the flow. That's why we call them free shear flows. It's as if shear occurs freely by the process of flow motions, not or not necessarily the existence of a wall, rigid boundary near the flow. 
That's why we call them shapefiles. So, jets, waves, mixing layers. Can you name a jet in daily life? I mean, have you seen a jet? Seen garden hoses? Garden hose is a jet. In water. Right? Have you seen a wake? If you look outside, sometimes you see this plume of pollution hits a building and then sheds past the building. Right? So it's, it's like a wake. Which means a flow becoming unstable as it flows that behind and past an object. Right? It's called a wake. Mixing layers, a little bit more abstract, but, but mixing layers also occur. You have different layers of fluid flowing uh, one on top of the other, and it's and then they, they kind of mix. Uh, I mean, the, the layers could have different uh, densities of temperatures. It happens in the oceans all the time, it happens in the atmosphere all the time, where you have stable bound layers, and then it's like a cold layer uh, below and a warm layer above. It's these two layers are flowing, and then they become unstable and mix. So all of these are instances of free shear force. We are going to discuss only the round jet in this course. This type of flow is created by a fluid exiting a nozzle with diameter d, as uh, they mentioned that produces approximately a flat-topped and uniform velocity profile uj. The flow then enters uh, an ambient background which is at rest. I mean, the background could also be moving, but one simplification you could make is the, the jet is coming into a still, non-moving background. Also, the flow is a statistically stationary and axis symmetric. I mean, that's one of the characteristics of jets. Jets are usually very circular, uh, which means that there is an axis of symmetry. No matter which angle you look at the jet, it's, I mean, the spin the garden hose, right? It's all the same, uh, whichever um, angle you look at it. Um, but you could have a slit, I mean, it, not necessarily you need a sort of a, a round nozzle, you could have sort of a slit where you make a sheet or shear layer, so to speak. And I, I can show you some examples here. The diffusers on the ceiling, you see the slits? Air comes out as a sheet, right? So this is not a jet, it's a different type of flow. It's like, like, like a shear layer, more or less. So, if I want to show you a picture of the jet, which, which meets the criteria above, it's, it's this. So that there's a nozzle, the diameter d flow comes out at some uh, velocity uj. We say uh, it's flat head, which means flow as just as it comes out. I mean, for us, the the profile of velocity is, is flat. It's constant. There's axis of, axis of symmetry. Uh, you could look at this flow in two different types of coordinate system. Because there's an axis of symmetry, it's useful to look at it in the polar cylindrical coordinate, where you only have x, which is the along the uh, axis or along flow uh, direction. You have radial axis, which tells you how far away from the center, central axis. And then you have angle theta, which gives you the angle around. Um, <coughs> But you can say, uh, use the same flow uh, uh, and show the same flow in the Cartesian coordinate system. There's nothing wrong with that. You still have u, v, and w. But it turns out, because of the axis of symmetry, the polar cylindrical coordinate is uh, more appropriate and mathematically convenient. Are you using this, Scott? Correct. Are you using polar cylindrical coordinate for some of your simulations? Yeah, well, we do the mesh on the screw blades we're using. Well, yeah, so and you can testify yeah. how easy it becomes after you do that, right? Anyway, it's good. Okay. Um, do I need to underline anything here? Well, maybe not, but I told you everything that there is the, act, the, the X, X and R in the um, axial radial, the radial coordinate angle theta, and I showed you, so x r theta, and I also showed you u, v, and w 
components, or if you like, X, Y, and Z components, if you will, to show this flow. Three parameters specify much of the dynamics of a jet, and these are just the following. UJ, which is the jet exit velocity, diameter of the nozzle, and the kinetic viscosity of the fluid. So these three very well characterize the jet behavior. In fact, you can calculate the jet Reynolds number by using these three parameters. It's defined as, as follows. For any Reynolds number, you need a velocity scale, uh, viscosity scale, and length scale. For jets, the most appropriate uh, length scale is the diameter of the jet, or the nozzle making the jet. And again, this number can be low or high. If it's, it's the Reynolds number is small, you have a jet which is laminar. If Reynolds number is very large, you have a jet which is highly turbulent. And there are some very nice classic papers, like Journal of Fluid Mechanics, for example, by Hussein et al., 1994, which does a great job in characterizing jets. And we, we would refer to some of those results for our work. The mean velocity of a jet is predominantly in the axial direction. That means the velocity in the radial directions are very small. Note that at the radial distance r equal to zero is where you're at the center of the jet or on the axis of symmetry. The jet axis is defined about which the profiles of the mean velocity profile u are symmetric. So there's an axis of symmetry, right? So anywhere you are around that axis, you get the same uh, velocity. Due to symmetry, the mean circumferential velocity is zero. And I can explain that. I mean, circumferential velocity is velocity in this direction. So the jet is going out of the garden hose, or jet is going out. There is an axis of symmetry. There's no reason why the jet should rotate this way or rotate that way. It must go straight. So the circumferential velocity must be zero by symmetry. However, the, the, the mean radial velocity does not need necessarily to be zero, but I claim it to be really small compared to the axial velocity. The radial velocity is, is, is velocity away from the ax, uh, central axis, right? I mean, this jet is going in, but it could slowly expand. So there's a radial component of velocity which pushes, pushes the jet outward away from the center of the central axis. So this doesn't have to be zero, this radial velocity, but I'm telling you the fact, for a fact, that it's much smaller than uh, the axial. And next time you're, you're using your garden rose to water the flowers, just look, I mean, flow mainly goes out, right? It doesn't spray sideways. Make sure, does it make sense? It mainly goes out axially. Very, it, it goes sideways and radially out very gradually. That means, must mean, radial velocity is much smaller than the axial velocity. So we know some uh, features of the mean velocities given the symmetry of this uh, type of flow. Let's talk about axial velocity. The center line mean axial velocity can be defined in terms of mean axial velocity. So basically, if um, the radial um, component is zero at any angle, let's say zero, you're looking at the center of the jet. 
So if, if you put zeros on these two arguments for r and theta, you get the jet um, mean velocity on the axis, right? So we, we show this with u naught. Of course, it's some sort of a statistical mean velocity, right? Because I have angle brackets here, but I don't bother to show it here. Basically, subscript zero takes care of that. So if you like, the idea is this. So the jet is coming out. This is the central, central axis. At any point, I have, I could have a different u naught at the center. Probably, initially, this u naught is very large, but the, the jet slows down by the surrounding friction. At a different distance, velocity may be lower. At any distance, I get a different velocity. These are all statistical mean velocities uh, in the x direction on, this, on the axis of the jet. And again, the zero and zero mean must mean center line. Another useful number to define is the Jeff, uh, not Jeff, but Jeff is my friend. I call it, but jets, jets half width. We, we know this as r one half, which is also a function of x, but let's see what it is. Define as radial distance where the mean axial velocity is half of the center line axial velocity. And I can put a picture to it to satisfy you. Let's put it this way, rotate this. If you look at, let's say, let's say this is component R, and that's component X. At any point, uh, at any point I inspect my jet, um, the velocity close to the center of the jet is the highest. So it, this could be at a particular given coordinate x. This velocity is u naught at some given x, but the jet velocity goes down as you move away from the center of the jet. At some point, you're going to hit half of that velocity on either side, or circumferential on anywhere. At some distance, call this r one half. At r one half, you're going to hit one half of u naught x anywhere you look. So it's the distance where jet velocity is half of its its, cent, its radial distance where the jet velocity is half of the central axis velocity. Of course, this half distance vary as a function of x, and I can demonstrate quite nicely by another diagram like down here. If you have a jet, you have a jet, the first, first the jet comes out of the nozzle with uniform velocity. Um, so the, the velocity is like this. The, the, the profile is like a, a square profile, but it's, then, then slowly this is going to uh, spread out. So slowly it spreads out. So the jet widens, if you like. You could imagine the half width is going to change. Here, half width doesn't exist because if you get square profile, here the velocity drops to half here. So that's my half width. 
to here, the velocity drops to half maybe here. So that's my half width. And here, half of the velocity occurs much at a much greater radial distance, so the half width increases. The central axis, axis symmetry I showed here. So mathematically, you can, you can put it this way. Mean velocity at, at half radial distance, no matter what circumferential location or angle theta, is going to be one half of the central axis velocity. That's the definition. And as we said, uh, that, that the jet's half width is not constant, but a function of axial distance. In fact, this half width constant increases further away from the nozzle, and I showed a picture for you over there. <coughs> the next topic, any questions so far? It looks good. If you add in um, like a gravity term, would you follow along the jet as it kind of drops, as like your axis? Uh, yeah, good, good point, Scott. Yeah, if you have gravity, uh, it, it would only affect significantly Suppose that the jet is going horizontally, gravity pushing down. It would only affect significantly if jet has a different, buoyant, a different density than the background air. Let's say if, jet, if this jet was methane, uh, in a, suppose methane was a light, high, uh, low density gas, and the background air was heavy, there was like krypton or whatever gas, right? Then the jet would go up because it's the body force will push it up in, that, in the momentum equation. But if jet was heavy, like the garden hose, right? You have a garden hose, water. Water is pretty heavy. You inject it in air. Uh, water is heavy, so the gravity will pull it down. If the density is the same, gravity is not going to affect it because it pulls or pushes equally on the jet flow as well as the background flow. So it cancels out. It's a good question. Self-similarity. Now, this is one of my favorite topics because, see, as a scientist or engineer, you know a very few principles to solve most of the problems. Like there is the principle of conservation, right? Conservation of mass, conservation of energy, you know, uh, like entropy and things like that, or uh, disorder in system, you know, like with a very few principles you can solve a lot of problems. There's the principle of symmetry, which physicists like it a lot, so with symmetry you can solve a lot of problems. There's another principle which is really interesting, that's called self-similarity. Self-similarity is a very profound, deep principle that enables solving a lot of problems in science and engineering. Maybe, maybe you haven't seen this one before. Many times you've seen, often you've seen principles of conservation and symmetry, but this one is pretty new. And I would define it and then show you how useful it is to formulate jet flows. Self similarity is an important concept in the study of turbulent flows. In mathematics, a self similar object is exactly or approximately similar to a part of itself i.e. the whole has the same shape as, a, as the parts. Many objects in real life are self-similar. Coastlines are statistically self-similar. Parts of them show the same statistical properties at many scales. Just give you one example, but there are many examples. You might think of a tree. A tree is a self-similar object, or some marine animals are self-similar. There's, there's lots of self-similar objects, but why do I claim, for example, a tree is, looks like itself uh, at many scales? I mean, if you have a tree, self-similarity,
at the bottom trunk of a tree, right? The tree branches out. Okay? So let's suppose it's a very long and thick trunk, but then when you get closer to the higher branches, you might get a smaller shapes which look like the same. And then when you go higher, the very fine branches, I mean, even though scales down, but they have the same shape. I mean, if you like, let me put it this way. If you look at any um, joint, you might get three angles, alpha, beta, gamma. You, uh, you keep uh, seeing the same angles at many different scales, the whole and uh, parts of this structure. You see what's happening? The, the tree is a self-similar object in nature. Of course, I mean, not exactly. Um, I mean, this tree I'm looking at right out of the window, well, these angles change quite a bit. But if I do this statistically, let's say, I don't know, let's say this was a pine tree, if I looked at 1,000 pine trees of the same species and keep, all these, uh, uh, keep a record of these angles and then do statistical work, all of them will be similar or uh, equal at different scales. Like the, 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 the angles at the bottom of the, uh, the trunk uh, is going to be similar to the top branches, for example. Uh, so cell similar structures is one is a tree, and you can eat, and you you notice. I mean, you've you've done quite a bit of basic math. Do you remember any of the theorems in similarity of triangles? If I have a bunch of triangles, all of these triangles that I have are cell similar. I mean, these the small triangle here. If I have a bunch of angles here, like alpha. Beta gamma, the next triangle is the larger one, so has the same angles. So you get similar triangles. We use this concept in formulating. Uh, jet uh, jet flows, free shear flows. You can think of this uh, a jet is, it looks like a triangle if you want. I mean, just as it comes out, it looks like that. And then it's, the structure looks as uh, keeps growing in size. So jet is a self-similar object. And we use these concepts. To formulate. The next page is a bit of uh, mathematics. I won't show it, but you can, you can read it if you're interested. I'll jump into the applied side, which is called axial variation scales. But, but, but before I go there, there when, when you formulate a, a problem uh, using self-similarity, you need to come up with a similarity variable. Uh, like in the example I showed, those angles could be thought of as the similarity variables. They did not change the alpha, beta, gamma. Any problem has a, has a new or different similarity variable. And you, you should look for it and use that variable to formulate your problem. In JITS, We'll shortly see what the similarity variables are uh, quite shortly. In the next heading, let me first discuss axial variation of scales. That's one concept in JS. I'll just read it out and underline. So we, to characterize the jet, we need to define the variations of two scales, i.e., for example, the velocity scale 
at the axis u naught as a function of x and the length and, and the length scale um, half width. So you can study variations of two different scales. The, they, they cannot be the same scale. And that enables you to formulate uh, the jet dynamics. It is experimentally verified that the inverse of mean axial velocity, or u not x, specifically if you normalized it by nozzle velocity, uj, when you plot it against axial distance divided by nozzle diameter, this falls on a straight line. Okay? And the intercept of this line with the abisca defines the virtual origin denoted by x naught. So there you find your first relationship for jet flow. So this is nothing special, I'm just saying there is a linear relationship between this term and that term. Of course, that's the inverse. And the, the constant of proportionality is B. Okay. It's 5.9. It has been found empirically. And more, even uh, further, the intercept has been found to be around 4. Why you saying it all? So x not divided by d is around four. I'll put a picture to it briefly. Let me just finish underlining this part. The virtual origin represents mathematically the location where the self-similarity behavior of the jet begins. So you will see shortly what that means. If you have a jet. talking about self similar jet and mutual origin I have a jet there's there's a nozzle diameter D Jet is coming out with velocity uj. This jet is going to behave uh, something like that. Okay. Now, it's not self similar right from the beginning. I mean, it doesn't look like a bunch of similar tri triangles. It would start looking at as if I have similar triangles, given some virtual origin which is farther away from, from the jet exit point. So if you like, x naught is the, is the location where the self-similarity begins or the vertex of the similarity triangle is. So that's called x naught. Okay? And then from there on, self-similarity begins. I mean, if you like, then you get these uh, velocity profiles which look similar to one another. This x naught is known as the virtual origin. Let me now discuss the equations. or variable to study jets with is called the spreading of a jet. How quickly does it expand sideways in the radial, radial direction? Does this garden hose pulling water out this remain, stay focused, concentrated, 
or the water quickly expands radially. The spreading of a jet characterizes how the jet grows in the radial direction as a function of axial distance away from the nozzle. The jet spreading rate can be defined using the differential equation. Do you agree that the half radius or half radial distance somehow is a measure of how wide the jet is? If this half radial distance increases quickly with x downstream of the jet, the jet must be spreading very rapidly. Very soon it will expand into the background and it's going to lose its momentum. It's going to mix with the background. But if this is spreading, um, rate is small, this gradient or derivative is small, the half width radial distance is not changing much, so this jet will remain focused, concentrated, put, it just keeps going for a long distance. Okay? The spreading rate, too, can be shown that to be a constant in a self-similar region of the jet. And in fact, um, experimental work, by, again, Hussein et al. has shown spreading rate is about 10% or 0.1 for most jets. And in fact, if you integrate the spreading rate, you can obtain a formula for jet's half width. So that's another useful relationship. And it's phenomenal with a very few basic mathematical relationship you can describe the behavior of jets. That's, that's very powerful. In fact, you can be knowing some very basic relationships, you can go design entire industrial processes based on jets. I mean, spray paint applications, systems, or I mean, I don't claim you can go design rocket engines, but that's too simplistic. But maybe you can do back of the envelope calculations for those things. Um, very nice. That was promised. I'll spend another 10, 20, 10, 15 minutes on the similarity variable. What is the uh, similarity variable for a round jet? And now we're going to discuss that. In the well-behaved, self-similar region of a round jet, by the way, when I, when I say self-similar region, think of this picture, right? Uh, self-similar region is a region where the jet is geometrically re represents itself, the whole and its parts, and it could be anywhere here. The area very close to the nozzle, it's not self-similar, you know, it's just starts to expand and so on. So think of self-similar region after the virtual origin, to the right of this point, is the self-similar region. And for you to assume that, it must be, x over d must be greater than around 30. Oh, you also need a very high Reynolds number for a jet to be self-similar. If, if a jet has a Reynolds number of 100, it's not a jet. It's, it, it's very laminar type flow. It will not produce the self-similarity that it wants. So the Reynolds number must be high as well. The center line velocity u naught x and the half width are half vary according to equations in the previous section. The empirical constant B and S are independent of the Reynolds number. A cross-stream similarity variable can now be defined. Cross-stream similarity variable. Cross-stream means how is the jet behaving in the radial direction. And that's what I was talking about. So let me show it to you. Cross-stream means that means this. If you divide the radial distance by half width, you're going to get the same number anywhere in the jet. Think of the angles alpha, beta, and gamma of a tree, right? 
This variable is not going to change anywhere you look. For example, if the jet is very narrow, uh, like half of it is here, right? That's R1 half. And let's say the end of the jet may be here, right? R, that's where the jet effect ends. For a wider jet, I mean, the jet may be wider, so the end effect or the edge of the jet is farther out in the radial direction, but so is the half distance. You see what's happening? The ratio of the two is the same anywhere you look at the jet. So here the jet was going from left to right. We call this the similarity variable. Anybody knows what this Greek symbol is called? Yes, the online viewers got XI. Okay, what is this one called? Psi. How do you spell that? PSI. PSI, right. So that's, uh, that's the xi is a similarity variable, so is eta. However, eta is defined slightly differently. Here I'm dividing r, radial distance by distance from the origin, central origin. But again, these triangles are self-similar anyway, so it doesn't matter if you use any size of the triangle, it will give you a similar similarity relationship. So here, if you like, Think of it this way. Um, if you look at a triangle, this and this is the, the edge of your jet, right? You see what's happening? Doesn't matter where you look. Central, uh, the virtual origin, and that's x. This is x minus x naught. And here is your R. So again, this triangle will be similar. Doesn't matter. So either Xi or Eta will give you a similarity variable. Of course, here I'm showing half of the jet. The other half is down below. I mean, really, jets are just triangles. For, for a very practical effort. These, these two variables are in fact related by the spreading rate. How fascinating. So eta and psi are related by S, the spreading rate. And you can fit a function for this uh, similarity variable. And a lot of the times it happens to be some negative exponentials. One example is this. So the function for the function of eta is 1 plus some constant a, eta squared, all to the power of minus 2, where uh, a is just a constant. Likewise, so you can do the, the so, so that, so you can, so any, any property in the flow is self-similar. It doesn't have to be momentum in the x direction. It could be momentum in the y direction. It could be Reynolds stress component. It could be variance. It could be any of these things. So the mean, the mean lateral velocity in the self-similar region, V, can also be determined from U by the continuity equation. We'll do all of that when we delve into the navier stokes equation. Likewise, self-similar profiles of V over U naught can be obtained. The mean lateral velocity is usually found to be much more than or even order one of the magnitude smaller um, than the mean axial velocity. That means velocity, if the jet is going this way, the radial velocity is very small, but the axial velocity is very large. The area velocity is 3% of the axial velocity. 
and the edge of the jet, the mean lag velocity is actually negative, and this we know as uh, interrange method. How can a jet have a negative uh, radial velocity? Well, it can. Um, and I can convince you uh, quite nicely here. On the very edge of the jet, the jet pulls air in from the outside. You can imagine a sort of a vortex uh, or eddy on the edge. It actually pulls air in. So if, if air is being pulled in, it's being interrained in the jet. That's why the lateral velocity here will be negative. So this we know as interrainment. Very nice. I have another f uh, few minutes, maybe four minutes, so I could get the next piece started. But are there any questions so far? It's very empirical, but we haven't even started looking at the Navier Stokes momentum equation. We will in the next lecture, like, like we did for Walls, uh, we will do that. But now we're just doing empirical work, very useful empirical work. Let's talk about Reynolds stresses. Jet flow is turbulent flow, so it must have a lot of fluctuations in it. And you could look at either axial radial polar cylindrical coordinate system like, like the one I showed you, or you could look at um, it, the Cartesian type uh, coordinate system. Either way, the jet will, you can calculate the Reynolds stresses of the jet. The well, the stress is given uh, is, a, is a tensor. It must have nine components, and I'm showing it to you here on this uh, in using this matrix for a round jet. The fluctuating velocity components in the x r theta coordinates are denoted by u v and w. Now, it is convenient to look at the polar cylindrical coordinate, so that's the one we're going to use here, right? We're not going to use this one, but I could if we wanted to. If I use this one, u is velocity along x, or if you want the fluctuation u, along v is along r, and w is along theta. So w is the circumferential velocity. You see what I'm saying? So the jet w is the circumferential velocity. V is radial velocity, and U is axial velocity. Of course, these are fluctuations. I'm using lowercase. And the Reynolds stress can be given by this matrix. What's weird about this matrix? It has zeros, a bunch of zeros. That's the weird thing. But you, you could uh, rationalize it. Because of circumferential velocity, any um, real stress term involving W, uh, U, W, or V, W must be zero. The, the, the mean of those must be zero. There's no reason why you must get, let's say, 0.3 U, W. Why not minus 0.3? Makes sense? I mean, the, the symmetry of the problem states that the, the mean of the covariance must be zero. Okay? But I'm not saying the mean of uh, variance of uh, circumferential velocity should be zero. No, that is not zero because it's a positive quantity. Okay? So W's, the variance of W is not zero, but covariance of W with U and V are zero. Now, 
as the r approaches zero, the radial component uh, the velocity at the circumferential actually collapse and become indistinguishable. If you get very close to the center of the jet, this happens, right? If you go from here, get close, 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 close to the center, at some point, V and W are indistinguishable. You have to use your uh, 3D imagination to appreciate that. Therefore, on the axis of the jet, these two uh, variables are, must be similar. V e squared and W squared. It's equal. Very nice. And you can define uh, even uh, similarity functions for uh, Reynolds stress components. Consider the root mean square of the axial velocity on the center line. If you take the square root of that, you get a variance and you can fit uh, all, a lot of the um, similarity functions to Reynolds stress components as well. And I can get to the bottom of this page. Maybe next time. <laughs> but time is um, up, so we have to let the next class begin. Any questions? Looks good. So please um, attend your computer simulations. This will help the material to settle in. We'll see you next time. Great. Fantastic.